All right, well, thank you all for uh, waiting till the very end. Obviously, we saved the best for the last. Um, uh, deep learning is one of the, the hottest topics in, in uh, computer science at this point in time. So we just wanted to share as to what we've been doing in this area. So just in case you know, you've not, not been tracking media for the last month or so, um, the, the Turing Award this year, which is the biggest prize that you can get in computer science, was, uh, was made to these three gentlemen who are the, the, the grandfathers of, of the field of uh, deep learning. So really, it's, it's uh, you know, much like the, the Nobel Prize in Science, you get this award if you've demonstrated core contributions to an area that have been proved out over a bunch of time. And I would say that over the last six or seven years, we've seen deep learning make you know, a lot of revolutionary advances and impact on real world applications. Um, so closer to home for us, you know, here at NERSC and the field of high performance computing, uh, last year at Supercomputing 2018, uh, our team, in collaboration with Oak Ridge and NVIDIA and UC Berkeley, were awarded the Gordon Bell Prize, which is the, the top prize in the field of high performance computing. So we were successful in taking a deep learning application and scaling it on all of Summit, which is the number one machine in the world at this point in time. And for the first time, two applications were successful in breaching the exaflop mark. So again, you know, we've talked about exascale computing for about a decade now. And uh, this is one of two applications which were able to exceed that mark um, last year. So um, you know, just in case maybe you don't care about the hype and you really want to understand what deep learning is and is not good for you, your applications. So I did want to call out you know, very early on that um, deep learning is, is a part of a much broader toolbox in analytics that you should be aware of. So uh, you know, if you've been doing classical statistical analysis for significance tests and so on, please you know, continue on. I mean, there's no need necessarily for you to do deep learning. Uh, if you've been doing classical linear algebra for solving you know, large matrices and so on and so forth, then you should continue doing that. Uh, but if you care about um, artificial intelligence and perhaps you've dabbled in machine learning already, I know that you know, when Roland asked you for a raise of hands, none, none of you raised your hand, so maybe it's a safe assumption that you, you haven't been using machine learning so far. But there are, there are classes of applications that machine learning is well suited for and AI is well suited for. And certainly for those class of applications, it is worth considering uh, whether you should use deep learning or not. So in particular, just to be very concrete, um, <clears throat> you know, this is a, a chart of use cases. So different kinds of problems are laid out along rows, and then different science areas are laid out along, uh, along columns. So perhaps if you care about pattern classification problems, so I give you an image and you're supposed to tell me, is this an image of a star or a galaxy? Uh, those kinds of problems are really well suited for machine learning, and deep learning can certainly get state-of-the-art performance. If you care about regression problems, so maybe you don't care about class labels, but you care about predicting a continuous valued quantity, uh, then again, deep learning is proving to be very successful in those applications. There are many other use cases, so clustering, I give you a bunch of points, and you need to tell me uh, you know, what, what is the most natural clustering structure in this, in this data set. Uh, deep learning can help there. If you care about dimensionality reduction, so you have very high dimensional data, so a million dimension perhaps, uh, and you'd like to understand what is the intrinsic dimensionality of this data set, then potentially deep learning can help there. There are many, many other use cases. Again, you know, deep learning is not quite well suited for every single row in this problem, but I would say that if you have labeled data, so examples of classes or examples of regression uh, quantities, then for these first two rows, I think what we are seeing across the board is that deep learning can certainly work really well. So that's just to give you a flavor for the kinds of problems that deep learning is well suited for. Um, you know, we can spend a whole hour just chatting about uh, use cases, but uh, this is meant to be a very practical tutorial on what, uh, you know, if, if you care about deep learning and you'd like to use it, then uh, what can you do about it at NERSC? So again, uh, software is something that we do, we provide. Um, so if you are a user and you'd like to use deep learning, then the four frameworks that you can use are Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Cafe. Those are the technologies that we've sort of hand-selected for you after a lot of deliberation and thought. Uh, there is always going to be a, a long tail in terms of number of frameworks. I think about a year ago, uh, I think new deep learning frameworks were emerging every single you know, uh, month. But things, I think, have slowed down a little bit. There isn't maybe as much activity. Uh, nevertheless, we do expect a lot of people to develop a lot of solutions in this layer. Now, you know, Rebecca and others uh, chatted about hardware, what sort of systems we have at NERSC right now. So, you know, we do have CPUs, KNLN has well. Uh, in the future, our next machine is going to feature GPUs. 
So if you wanted to use this hardware, uh, you know, we at NERSC need to work with vendors and make sure that all of the intervening layers in the stack are, are working well. So in particular, if you have CPUs, then we work with Intel to make sure that MKL DNN supports deep learning software for running on CPUs. And then we are working with NVIDIA right now on enhancing CoDNN so that it works well on GPUs. Now it is very, very likely that uh, in the future, NERSC systems will have accelerators or special purpose hardware for computing. And some of the best accelerators at this point in time are in the area of deep learning. So if these show up tomorrow, then we will again work with the relevant vendors to make sure that you write your application once in those frameworks, and we'll continue to make sure that the application, the same applications will work well on, on uh, emerging hardware. All right, so, so I think it, just, just a, a word on software frameworks. Again, you know, Roland chatted about Python and Jupyter and how those are interesting technologies that are you know, evolving very fast. I would say that 10 years ago, if you, know, you uh, uh, you'd asserted that Python was going to be important in an HPC center, um, not many people would listen to you. I think uh, similarly, uh, all of these frameworks have emerged in the last three or four years. So this is just a, a time-evolved plot of um, how many users in the community broadly, not NERSC, but in the community broadly, have been using these frameworks. So I would say that you know, Cafe and, and Theano were, uh, were really popular three or four years ago, but since then their usage has, has flattened. And as soon as Google released TensorFlow, this, uh, this pink line, uh, that has certainly emerged as the top deep learning framework of choice. And uh, PyTorch, released by Facebook, is certainly you know, rising as well. So we've been tracking how, again, these deep learning frameworks have been evolving over time. And again, we made a careful decision on what we will support here at NERSC. But certainly, uh, you know, as a user, if there are other frameworks that you like, um, as Rollin was mentioning, you can use Shifter. You can boot up the software stack. You know, get, get it up and running. So it's certainly possible for you to bring your own framework uh, here as well. So here are just some comments on uh, you know, what we think about all of these frameworks. So if you are a, a naive deep learning user and you want to get up and running really fast, uh, you maybe don't care about the specifics of you know, deep learning architectures and so forth, then Keras is really the way to go. I mean, that's the, the, the go-to tool which is probably the most productive and in the fewest lines of code, perhaps even in you know, two dozen lines of code, you can get your deep learning app up and running. So that's uh, the thing that I, I would recommend. Now, underneath Keras, TensorFlow, again, as I mentioned, is Google's de facto uh, deep learning framework. And um, you know, there are, there's a rich ecosystem of uh, capabilities within TensorFlow that a lot of engineering effort has been spent in, by, by Google on. And you can leverage that in, in your application. A lot of high quality content, um, you know, there are training courses online uh, that, that you can also use in, in that space. PyTorch is a, is a recent incumbent from, from Facebook. And um, I'd say that if you care about maybe two use cases, uh, graphs, so if you want to do deep learning on graphs, and then if you care about dynamic computation, so essentially your network changes with time, then PyTorch is best suited for those application areas. Now, again, three, four years ago, CAFE was, uh, was actually developed at UC Berkeley down on campus. And um, it was extremely efficient. Um, uh, but I would say that its usage has certainly flattened out o over time. Uh, but we do support, for the time being, we do support CAFE on, on our systems here. All right, so you know, maybe, you care, maybe you'd like to explore TensorFlow and Keras on their systems. How do you, uh, you, know, how do you invoke those? So the default Anaconda Python distributions that Roland talked about, uh, you know, they do have these, these things inbuilt. Um, so you just do a you know, module load uh, Python, and then module load TensorFlow, and there you go. It's, it's available for you. Now, behind the scenes, we worked uh, fairly intensively with Intel to make sure that the MKL DNN library is, is configured, it's, it's installed, it's working well. So a lot of effort has gone behind the scenes. And uh, there is a pointer to an Intel blog, um, which you can click on. So if you care about performance and really eking out the, you know, the very last flop, then uh, you can check out some of the performance sensitive settings for the Intel MKL DNN li uh, library through that blog. Same thing for PyTorch, it's relatively simple. So you just do a module load Python, uh, and then load this particular module. And uh, you'll have access to the, um, uh, the, the PyTorch framework at, at NERSC. 
Now, you can do all of this stuff through a command shell or you can do it through a Jupyter notebook. And again, uh, Jupyter, you know, much like Roland described, is, is definitely the preferred front end for developing analytics uh, capabilities. So you can bring up uh, kernels, uh, both TensorFlow and PyTorch kernels in Jupyter. Um, and you can run, I would say, maybe small scale exploratory jobs on, on the Jupyter nodes. But in the future, uh, we will be enabling uh, deep learning jobs to run on the compute uh, nodes, so the KNL nodes and the Haswell nodes. And uh, you know, we did talk about the, the Cori GPU rack that's available now. So soon we will also be able to support running deep learning jobs on the GPU racks. So you, you're gonna stick to your Jupyter notebook front end, and then all of the computation will run on the back end. And in the Jupyter notebook, you can figure out you know, essentially how your uh, deep learning jobs are converging and training and so on. So some of the examples of essentially launching these notebooks are all available here. You can, you can check those out later on if you'd like. So I just did, you know, it's a tutorial at the end of the day, so I did want to show you some code. Uh, the, the details are not as important, but I think the point here is that within just two slides, you know, two dozen lines of code, you can get a deep learning job up and running. So this is a Keras example. Uh, the, the task here is to look at such digits and classify what's a zero, what's a nine. Um, and the steps are fairly simple. So you import a bunch of stuff right in the beginning, uh, you, whatever uh, modules you might need, whatever libraries you might need within Python. You load your data. There's a bunch of pre-processing that happens on the data set. You create your network. Um, you essentially fit your network, and then you, you use your trained network to make predictions. Now, we're not gonna have you know, in 20 minutes, we can't do a tutorial on deep learning end-to-end, uh, -end, but th those are essentially the key steps. Load a bunch of stuff, I mean, all of the modules that you need, load your data set, do pre-processing or cleaning of the data set as you need, uh, create your network, apply, uh, essentially do training on your network and uh, make predictions using your network. So essentially in two dozen lines of code, that's essentially a simple deep learning model that, that can be done. And again, Keras is really what you know, makes this possible. There are a lot of details around optimizing deep learning on CPUs and running on multiple nodes. Um, I don't think I'm gonna have time for that today. Um, but uh, you can check out this web page wherein we've been systematically tracking the performance of uh, TensorFlow and, and PyTorch on a range of standard benchmarks which are uh, used in the community like AlexNet and GoogleNet and so on and so forth. So we do have performance regressions periodically and we try to make sure that the, the TensorFlow and PyTorch builds on nurse systems are performant. Now, once you've made sure that uh, deep learning software is working well on a single node, obviously the next step is to run on multiple nodes. And um, you know, the simplest strategy that you can adopt for uh, you know, essentially having deep learning run on multiple nodes um, is, is using this thing called data parallelism. So essentially you boot up the same network on multiple nodes and you break up your data set into pieces. Every node looks at a slightly different data set. So um, then essentially what you need to do is to do a reduction. Uh, make sure that uh, after your local node has looked at its local data set, uh, there is a reduction phase wherein everybody uh, shares the gradient updates or shares the, the parameter estimates and they all you know, converge on a single network at, at the end of the day. So uh, these, that, that particular mode of parallelism, data parallelism, is, is supported um, through two means. One is Horoward, which comes from Uber, and then there is a Cray plugin, uh, and both of them can easily support that mode of, of, of parallelism. And we've done, again, a lot of work in scaling TensorFlow and PyTorch with both of those plugins, and uh, they seem to work fairly well. All right, I think I'm gonna skip this particular snippet. Um, but I did want to sort of bring up the, the very last slide, which is on support. So that's sort of a you know, sense for you for what software frameworks you can use, what exists at NERSC right now. Uh, but really, this is an emerging area. It's moving extremely fast. So we at NERSC are trying to do our best in terms of making sure that the software is up to, up to date. But then also, we're learning more and more about uh, the, the network architectures, what works best, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think while you might hopefully have an easy time in, in just getting up and running at NERSC, chances are that you're gonna have a lot of sophisticated questions around, uh, you know, is deep learning really best suited for my problem? What deep learning architectures make sense for this particular data set? 
uh, if my model doesn't converge or uh, doesn't give me the accuracy that I need, what do I do next? So there are a lot of um, uh, questions that you might face, and I think these are the, the people you can reach out to. So Mustafa, Steve, and Wahid are all of the, uh, the machine learning and deep learning engineers in the group. So feel free to send them an email. But obviously, if you have any issues with uh, the existing production software that we have up and running, uh, you know, feel free to send an email to consult and dunce.gov, as you always do. And we do have now, I think, a reasonable documentation in place on machine learning. So you can check out all of the instructions for software. Uh, we do have a range of use cases there. And we've certainly been making an effort to present day-long tutorials. Again, I just had 20 minutes for this, but we do have day-long tutorials on uh, deep learning at uh, supercomputing, at international supercomputing, and then also at the Cray user group meeting. So you should you know, feel free to check that, that material out. All right, so I think that's all I have for deep learning. Do you have any, any questions on any of that? All right, so I think we are done.